My name is Ari Rudolph. I'm a vice president at the Jewish Funders Network, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the success factor session on virtual program delivery. Our speakers today are Kim Coulter, CEO of JBS Toronto, Ruben Rotman, CEO of Network for Jewish Human Service Agencies, and Jerry Rubin, CEO of JBS Boston. We only have 20 minutes, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Ruben, who will get us going. Thanks, Ruben. Thank you so much, Ari, and thank you all for joining us. Um, this, this session is called a success factor, uh, a bright spot. Um, we wanna share with you a realization that our sector has come to, which we think is absolutely a success and a bright spot that we need to move forward with together. So um, as Ari said, uh, I represent the network of Jewish human service agencies. We are an association of direct service providers providing a full range of services for the Jewish community and others. Um, these include mental health services, uh, workforce services, uh, food pantry services, um, support with housing assistance, providing support for persons with disabilities, a range of services in the poverty arena. And what we've learned over the last, going back to early March, um, all of our agencies, as the lockdown orders came through, and as the shutdown orders were put into effect, all of our agencies needed to transition the manner in which they provide those services, which historically has been in-person, face-to-face, from that type of a traditional modality to virtual service delivery. The disruption has been dramatic, it's been intense, it's been complicated, and it's been filled with lots of surprises along the way. Our agencies needed to think through technology issues. They needed to think through staffing issues. They needed to think through access issues, especially for clients that did not have access to computers or technology. They also needed to think through privacy and confidentiality issues. Not an easy process. And they needed to wonder along the way, how do we actually do the work? How do we deliver services that historically, traditionally, are, are thought of as being most impactful with the best outcomes in person? Will they be as meaningful if they're delivered virtually? Will we really be able to help people through this virtual world? And so um, little by little, one by one, the waves spread across the US, the waves spread across Canada as well, and agencies learn from each other, the network helped agencies along the way, but um, we've learned a ton. And so what we are gonna share with you are two case examples from two communities. Um, the first, uh, Kim Coulter is gonna talk about what's going on in Toronto at her agency, JVS Toronto. And then Jerry Rubin is gonna share experiences from JVS Boston. And then I'm going to close by talking about what their experiences um, translate to in terms of opportunities for our North American system writ large, and where each of your communities can be part of this as well. So we'll start with Kim, CV CEO, JBS Toronto. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Appreciate it. So my name is Kim Coulter. I'm with JVS Toronto. Um, JVS Toronto is um, a multi-service organization that provides employment supports as well as career education and psychology supports to the community at large. Our roots are in the Jewish community and we have programming targeted specifically to the Jewish community and have had for many, many years. Um, JVS in particular has had a history of providing online services through our pre-arrival services for newcomers to Canada. Um, and we've been doing that for, for quite some time. So in some ways it positioned us well, because uh, we had the expertise and the technology to be ready to move remotely. Of course, nothing really prepared us for um, uh, the speed with which we needed to do that back in March. But, but uh, as all of us did around uh, the Zoom meeting, we did nonetheless. So we had a sharp increase in our use of technology. Um, what we were surprised about was our ease of training staff um, with new technologies and using technology to do the training, as well as our service content all online. What we saw from a staff level is that people moved from a place of fear and anxiety 
to a place of excitement and pride in their ability to do this work. You know, we've been around a long time. We have some long time employees who their comfort level with technology was not all that, all that high and others that was very high. And I would say now that we have a much more level ground for all of our employees and we're proud of that and happy for that. Um, from, a, from a service perspective, we've really, this has allowed us an opportunity to create innovative and creative services. From an employer services side, we have and we um, did our first virtual job fair just actually before COVID in the winter and now since then have done more. We've expanded our employer learning modules to be delivered all online, which is so um, convenient for employers. Some of those include things like diversity, inclusion in the workplace, et cetera. And serving our employers virtually has been also much easier than we thought it was going to be. And one of the things our job coaches are doing are actually doing virtual employer site tours with clients, um, walking through, uh, the employers walking through with a laptop and giving a tour of an employer site, all very, very interesting. In addition to our employer services, our counseling services that support the employment work has been very, um, very active in creating new, new virtual workshops and one-on-one -on -one services that we didn't have before. Career resiliency is a really good example of one and a huge focus, as many of you probably are as well, on mental health and anxiety and helping clients cope with, with those, uh, those impacts on their, on their life. The other thing that has benefited us greatly is spending the time and energy to learn from our community partners, both at a local community service level and across Canada and internationally through the network, because there's always something to learn from someone, from someone else. Some of the standout services for us have been, I already mentioned our virtual employer services. And the other one is one of our client groups. Um, we have multiple client groups. We have um, uh, services specifically for the, for the Jewish job seekers. We have newcomers to Canada. We have youth at risk. We have people with disabilities and the general unemployed. What we have found across our divisions is a real difference between uh, for client groups that are able to pick up some of the technology and our newcomer services in particular great ease with technology doing services remotely, a little less so for some of our disability groups, although we've been very creative around that, and our youth groups that we thought would be really into uh, the remote work. Um, because they're youth at risk groups, it's been a challenging time for that group. Um, some of the silver linings have been um, work-life balance for our staff. We live in a huge city. And I can't tell you uh, uh, how many staff feel they are more productive and healthier because they're not spending two hours a day commuting to and from work. In fact, I, I didn't mention this in the last session, but we've seen our, our sick um, our sick banks uh, usage go, go way down. So people calling in sick way less frequently than they were in the past. Of course, um, I'm sure everyone's seeing that as well. And it also has resulted in improved customer service across the city. People don't need to travel to come to our services and they can do it all remotely. Some of the things internally for the organization have been new policies that we've created as a result of COVID, updating our privacy policies, our workplace accommodation policies, all those kinds of things. So a takeaway that I have for you is that uh, the message is virtual delivery is here to stay, <laughs> you know? Um, integrate it, reward it, and communicate the success of it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kim. Jerry, tell us about Boston. Uh, well, first of all, thanks, Ruben, and uh, thanks, Kim, and thanks to all of you who um, are joining us today. Uh, as I said in the other session, listening to Kim, I, I just keep nodding. Our experiences have been very, very similar, so I'm, I'm guessing there are some real um, <laughs> truisms that we've found and experienced. Uh, we're, we are a workforce development organization. That's our entire focus in Boston. Um, we serve uh, a, somewhere between 15 and 20,000 clients a year. Um, and uh, this year we'll be on the higher side rather than the lower side. Uh, how have we changed completely? Uh, before uh, March 15th, we were 98% uh, in-person operation. 
uh, no, actually uh, uh, service delivery and about 70% uh, um, in person in one location staff. Um, and we're now completely uh, remote. We moved all of our operations. It's out of ironic. We were actually growing with our remote staff because we do a lot of contracted work for employers. So we have staff and we were in multiple cities. We were trying to figure out how do we manage offsite staff versus onsite staff culture. Well, of course that problem is now gone because we're all in the same boat. Um, but all of our internal operations moved remotely. Um, we moved all of our services remotely. We, in any, on any given day, we're running somewhere over 60 classes um, with several thousand students um, in multiple locations and everything moved to a remote operation. So we actually never, we didn't stop any programming that we were running at this point, we're, we're fully operating. Um, and also our employment services moved remotely. So all of our job coaching, job matching, job fairs, we've run multiple uh, remote job fairs. And of course, this is really, really important because we have so many unemployed who are also dealing with social distancing. Uh, Massachusetts went from the lowest unemployment rate to the highest unemployment rate in the country, in the United States, in two weeks, uh, literally from one to 50 in two weeks. So a couple of standout services uh, I can talk a little bit about on the employment services side. Uh, by the end of March, we couldn't by necessity created what we call a talent match portal. So this is a web-based um, employment matching service. It's uh, kind of behind the scenes is a uh, talent matching uh, 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 applicant tracking system. Um, that's in the engine behind it. Um, but any job seeker can go online, can get either live chat or connected to a job coach. They can, if they have a resume, they can upload the resume. They can get help on applying for unemployment insurance, which was really important in the early days. Um, and they can actually start their job search. And then the tracking system automatically sends them uh, the proper hits. The other side, the employers do the same thing. They're uploading um, open positions, which we're curating, and we're managing all of that remotely. Um, so another uh, element that I think really stands out is how we've addressed the digital divide. So our clientele is very wide ranging um, from very low English and digital literacy to actually advanced education. So we have clients who speak no English and have no digital experience. And we have clients who may actually have a graduate degree in um, IT. Um, but we really had to address the digital divide. So we did several things. One is we created a laptop a library. We now have almost 400 um, computers out on the street to our clients with the goal being that no client will not be able to participate uh, because of technology limitations. We also have uh, hotspots. Um, we actually just set up a really great deal for hotspot delivery. We have a multilingual help desk. Um, we're using a third party with, uh, I think, eight different language capa uh, capabilities. And we have a, what we call digital navigators. So these are vol volunteers who will work more one-on-one -on -one, um, with clients who need help um, navigating their digital experience. Uh, in terms of, I'll mention a couple of sil silver linings. Uh, you know, we had a, a pretty major technology investment plan in place in the six months prior to COVID. Uh, it would have been better if we had another six months, but we didn't. Um, this was the kick in the pants that we needed. It moved us to really accelerate um, our, our technology investment and our technology change, which we knew we had to do because we were being outpaced in the private market. Our competitors were going in this direction and, and our employer uh, partners were demanding this from us as were our students. So we knew we had to do it, we just didn't because we were busy doing other things. So this really pushed us to, I think we probably saved ourselves three or four years by this kind of acceleration. We also learned, like as Kim said, that our staff um, and our clients responded much better to uh, did the transition to digital learning and remote learning than I would ever have imagined. Um, and in fact, we've discovered that there are many cases where remote learning is actually more effective and much easier for our clients for obvious reasons. They don't have to travel. And if their kids are home because of school being um, remote, um, this makes it a lot easier. So what's happened is recruitment is way up and class attendance is way up. So we're actually having better results. And when we're done with all this, we're gonna be a hybrid organization. We are absolutely, we are not going back to the old way. 
I'll stop right. there and I'll let Ruben. All right, so we, we have five minutes left. And so with the experiences that you heard from Kim and from Jerry, I'm going to share my, um, my screen and I'm going to um, tell you that we wanna build on this. Um, we want to, hold on. We want to make sure that we develop a North American initiative, one focused in the US and a separate one focused in Canada that first and foremost supports the impact of community members builds on the capacities of the expertise of our agencies um, to provide virtual service delivery on a continental basis. And what that means is we want to focus on the unemployed uh, resulting from COVID. We want to acknowledge that our system of agencies does have gaps. Not every community has the same set of services that Boston and Toronto have but they're still focusing on the need to address unemployment in the Jewish community. Um, not every agency that has a workforce, um, not every community that has a workforce agency provides exactly the same set of offerings. And so those living in one city should be able to draw from the expertise of another city. And, um, and lastly, we want to draw on the strengths of federations to engage employers um, and also to identify community members in need. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is that we're talking about launching what we call a national or a North American or two national employer panels, um, building on the knowledge that employers are hiring remotely building on the knowledge that federations do have connections and relationship building capacity with employers um, and bringing those connections to agencies, um, again, outside of their community, but through a national, a national network. We wanna grow capacity training so that other agencies in our system can build their strength and capacity to provide these services. And we want to um, also drill down for local case management services as needed because you can't do everything virtually. So um, there is still going to be a need for local immediate response for people in need. But where we can provide virtual and where we can draw on expertise throughout the system, we want to be able to do so. So um, I'm available for follow-up questions. Jerry and Kim are also making themselves available. Uh, you're gonna get this um, at the end from whoever sends things out to everybody. Uh, but basically um, the last point I just wanna note is that this, even if we don't launch this initiative, it's happening already. Both Kim and Jerry and the other uh, agencies in our system are already seeing clients from outside of their traditional uh, catchment areas. They're already having people log on to offerings that they're providing. So the community is asking for this. Our system has the capacity, the resilience, the creativity to respond and develop appropriately. And so we've started some dialogue with funders who are excited about this model. Um, and we also um, have started some dialogue with federations as well, because there's a, there's a way for them to be supportive and be part of this. We have 17 agencies in the US that have signed on. Um, we have two lead agencies in, in Canada that are gonna drive the initiative to support the rest of the agencies in Canada as well. So that's our concept. That's our big, bold, audacious, what Erica Brown said, um, our audacious response to poverty and particularly with the focus on unemployment. Questions, reactions before Ari shuts the Zoom room and we all zip away. <laughs> Ruben, I think Linda has a question that she wrote in the... Uh, Are there special considerations uh, in terms of servant payment subsidy limitations of clients come from outside locally funded area? Um, so in our model, not for the services that we're talking about offering, no. These services would be available for anybody. Again, a set of virtual 
offerings that we'd be providing. Uh, but at the end of the day, any specific local case management services, for example, accessing a, a local county or, or a provincial entitlement program, that would be subject to what the local you know, region has available. But the services that we're making available, no. Okay, uh, thank you. I think I'm gonna have to shut this down now. Um, okay. I wanna thank Kim, Ru Kim, Ruben and Jerry and for all of you for 